If you have your word today, I'd encourage you to open to 1 John chapter 1. And we are continuing our series, The Letters of John, today. And we are going to be reading from verse 5 through chapter 2, verse 2. Okay, so we're reading 5 through 10 in chapter 1, finishing off chapter 1, and then reading the first two verses of chapter 2. And so if you have your Bible today, if you have it open to 1 John chapter 1, I would encourage you to read it along with me. I'll be reading from the New King James today. So if that's a little different than your version, just follow along best you can, and uh, we will read this together. Okay, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we see that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we have it right in front of us to read it, and it's alive. It's the living, breathing word of God, and we believe that here today, and I pray that as we've read your word, that it would sink deep into our hearts, into our minds, and that you would re- reveal yourself through your word to each one of us today. Reveal what you're saying in these scriptures as we uh, dive into them together. Let us leave from here impacted by your word and challenged and encouraged and equipped to do what you've called us to do. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray, amen. So, quickly recapping last week, quickly, 1 John 1, 1 through 4 we read. There's really three main things that I wanted us to focus on last week. The first one is that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is. He is the incarnate Word. He walked and talked on this earth. He was a real man. He was 100% man, 100% God. That is a fact. That is what John wanted us to know, the church to know, that, hey, Jesus was not just a spirit, right? He wasn't just this deity. No, he was a physical man that came to die for the sins of man. Amen. Amen. The second thing is, Not only was he a man, but he loved us and he desired to have fellowship with us, with the believers. He he desired us to have fellowship with one another and to have fellowship with him and the Father. And that's why he came to die for our sins, because our sin had separated us from God, right? And this is what John was wanting to establish with the believers that, listen, we have to get this. We have to get that Jesus not only was a man, but that he desired fellowship with us, and he loved us and died for our sin. The third thing is that we learn what our fellowship produces. Anybody remember that three-letter word? What does fellowship with Jesus produce in our lives? Joy. That's right, Jen. Thank you. It produces joy in our lives because when we have Jesus in our hearts, when we are in tune with with the Lord, when we are following the Lord's commandments, when we are in fellowship with other believers, we can't help but be full of the joy of the Lord. And so John was laying this out for the church, trying to establish these 
these thoughts in their mind, these, these, these truths in their mind, so that they could be confident in their walk with the Lord. And so for today, what we, what we, what we are starting to see through the book of 1 John is that John is, this book is really written to provide an assurance of our salvation, right? Because there was a lot of false teaching spreading around. There was a lot of things being said. Remember we talked about this idea of Gnosticism and what that meant about how the body and the spirit have are kind of separate functions. They have no relation. And so, you know, we only need to be concerned about the spirit, our mind, not so much about our body. And what this led to was that there was no consequence for what we did in our flesh. There was no consequence for what we would call sin. Because there was no sin. Because uh, if it was only our, up to our, what our spirit, you know, how, how we thought in our minds, we could separate that from our bodies. And it erased the moral law, which we know God takes very seriously. Because that's what put Jesus on the cross, was sin that separated us from God, from God's law. You know, the Ten Commandments was God's way of revealing his holiness to us, was God's way of revealing that we fall short and that we need to be obeying certain commandments to show that we are in fellowship with God. And so there was this, this idea of Gnosticism that was very prevalent, and certainly today we have this idea. We have many ideas that are contrary to God's word, many, many, many ideas that are contrary to God's word. And so it's important for the church in the first century, and it's important for us today to understand that our salvation is only through repentance of our sin, through faith in Jesus Christ, through his blood that was shed on the cross that covers our sin, that reunites us with the Father. And if we don't get this truth about who Jesus was right, we miss the whole picture. We miss, we miss, we miss everything, right? We, we have to know that it's Jesus' blood that, that saves us. We have to know that it's the power of Christ that saves us from our sin. It's our repentance, right? This is essential for every Christian to believe. And so as a Christian, as we begin to see in, in, in this passage that we read, we must know that we are in a daily battle with an enemy. Certainly when we think of the enemy, we think of the devil, right? Satan, which he is. He is the enemy. He is roaming on, the, on this earth as we speak. You know, there, there are demonic forces at work every day. We might not see it with our eyes, but they are there. The Bible tells us that they are there. The Bible tells us we, we, we don't wrestle against princes and kings and principalities and powers. We wrestle against what? Against darkness, against, against the things that, that are not seen, right? And so it's important for us to be able to identify that the enemy is working. And how does he work in our lives? Hopefully he's not working in our lives, but there are times where he slips in, right? He tempts us. But what, what is it that, that he, he uses? Well, he uses this three-letter word called sin, right? It's our sin that separates us from the Lord. He, he tries to sow thoughts in our minds. He tries to put things in our life that would trip us up, things that are contrary to God's word, things that would break the fellowship that we have with Christ. And it's this sin that as a Christian, we have to be aware of. It should bother you when you sin. As a Christian, it should bother you when you sin. That is, that is one clear identifier where you are at with your fellowship with God. If you are desiring to uh, battle against your sin, those, those evil things that rise up in your spirit, right? Thoughts of, of anger or put whatever there you want that you know is contrary to the word of God. If you are not being convicted of your sin, where are you in your fellowship with Jesus? That is the question we need to be asking. 
So verse 5, I'm going to read it again. It says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So that first part, again, John is just reminding the church, listen, I was, I was there. Jesus gave me this message. He spoke it to me and the other disciples. We were, we were there when he ministered. For about three years, we, we walked and talked with Jesus. And by the way, I'm the only remaining firsthand account of, of who Jesus was. I saw him with my own eyes. I walked with him. I know what his audible physical voice sounds like, right? So John's reminding the church of this. And then the second part of verse 5, it says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. See, that word light, that represents God's divine and holy nature. It's not just talking about a bright light. It's talking about his divine, holy nature. And if God is divine, if God is holy, there can be no darkness in God. What does darkness represent? Well, it represents sin. It represents human sin. And so we see this clear contrast that John uses between darkness and light. And throughout the book of John, throughout the book of 1 John, we see these uses of metaphors. And what it does for the believer is it makes it very clear to the believer of how to live. It makes it very clear that if we are in fellowship with Jesus, there should be no darkness. Because where the light is, we've heard this all the time. You go into a dark room, you flip the light on, what happens to the darkness? It flees. It's gone. Right? It, it can't hang on to to its, it, it can't hang on, no darkness can hang on to anything and stay in the room as, as hard as it would try, right? It's just immediately by the authority of the light, the darkness is gone. And that's how it is with us as believers. If we are walking in the light, there should be no darkness. Now, does this mean that we never sin? Well, no, it doesn't. It does not mean that. And in fact, we'll get into that in a few minutes. But what I want to emphasize here is that this word light, it represents God's divine holy nature. It represents Jesus himself. In John's gospel, the same author of, of this book, John uses this phrase several times. And I'm just going to highlight a few of them. In John, <clears throat> excuse me, in John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness it could not even understand, right? It just has to leave. It has no place where there is light. John 3, 19 and 20. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For anyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. John 8, verse 12. Then Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. See, Jesus makes it very clear that he is the light. And what does that mean? That means he is the righteousness. He is divine. He is holy in nature. And if we are following Jesus, we are walking in the light. So our lives should be pictures of holiness, right? We are not perfect people, but we should be reflecting Christ, right? People should be seeing our lives, seeing the fruit in our lives and be seeing Okay, there's something different about him than me. There's something that he is holding on to, that, that he, that some kind of foundation that he is standing on that is different than what I'm standing on, right? We should be projecting the light of Christ. And what is that light? That light is holiness. That light is uh, righteousness. And so we have this 
this idea of, of deductive reasoning, basically, because if God is light, it follows that he cannot contain any darkness, right? We've established that, that fact. And so this shows that God is clearly a holy God, a perfect God, void of any, any kind of darkness or unrighteousness, spiritual and moral perfection. Now, this is in stark contrast with really this flawed thinking that is in the very next verse that John lays out for us. It says this in verse 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him, talking about Jesus, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. So in this verse, there's a, there's a, a big contrast here that we need to recognize, and that's the contrast between talking and walking. Have you ever heard the phrase, you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Right? Maybe someone said that to you. Maybe you've said that to somebody. You're like, you know, this guy talks a big game, but I don't know if he can produce what he's saying. This is exactly what John is saying. He's saying that you can, you can say that you have fellowship with Jesus, but are you walking in light or are you walking in darkness? And in fact, if you're walking in dark, darkness, you're a liar. Ouch. I don't want that to be me. And so we see in the New Testament how the Christian life is referred to as a walk. You know, we keep hearing walking in darkness, walking in light, Ephesians 4 verse 1 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Ephesians 5 8, this is the Apostle Paul. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. He's saying walk following the Lord, following Jesus. This is our Christian, this is the mandate of Christians, to walk in righteousness. Colossians 1.10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. We need to be living in a way that's worthy, right? That, that God it takes, takes pleasure in, right? That he can look at us and say, that is my child. They are following me. It's very important that we have a desire to walk in the light. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Now, certainly we know God's grace covers sin, right? And we all sin, we all fall short, and there's forgiveness, right? God forgives us of our sin. But we should be walking worthy of the God who calls us into his kingdom and glory. We should have a high expectation of how we need to be living as Christians. God expects it of us. And in fact, it's how we gauge our our fellowship with God. How do we know that we know that we know that we are saved? Is it by praying a prayer in VBS when you were three? Is that how we know that we know? Is it by coming to church one Sunday and getting a tingly feeling and being slain in the Spirit? Is that how we know that we know that we know? Certainly these things happen, right? But how do we know that we know that we know? The way that we know that we know that we know is by looking at the fruit of our life. Is the fruit of our life a product of walking in light or walking in darkness? This is how we know that we are true followers of Christ. This is why it's so important that we desire to walk in the light. This is why when John says, if we say we love the Lord, if we say that we are in fellowship with Jesus, but our life is, is a mess and we're living in unrepentant sin, we're living a lifestyle of darkness, we are lying. 
This is what the Bible tells us. We are not practicing the truth. And so in, in light of this thought, when, when we think about sin, we have, we, have to, we have to do something with sin. And as a Christian, really as, as, as any human being, there are three things in regard to sin that a, that a human has a response to, right? A, a human being has a response, a certain response in regard to sin. And the first one is not good. And this is something that, unfortunately, a lot of professing Christians and even a lot of Christians struggle with. When sin comes, when, when, when we are tempted, when things latch on to us in our carnal flesh. Sometimes as Christians, the easiest thing to do is to cover it up, to hide it. Right? We try to hide our sin. Why? Because we might be embarrassed, we might be ashamed, we might know it's wrong. And we, we try to hide it, right? Sin arises up in our lives, and maybe we're the only ones who know about it. And we try to hide it. We think, you know what? I got this. I got this under control. I can still live for the Lord in this area or this area. But you know, this, this little sin over here, it's okay. It's okay. I'll, I'll just keep it in check, right? Sin is death. Bottom line, sin leads to death, right? You can keep a tiger chained up in your bedroom and think that it's going to be okay unchecked. Eventually, that tiger, in its persistence, seeing you there, you know, day after day, is going to want to attack. It's going to want to give all it can to break from that chain and wreak havoc in your life and kill you, right? It's kind of a crazy example, having a tiger chain in your room. Think of, think of any threat in your life that, that would threaten your, your actual livelihood, keeping it close to you and leaving it unchecked. Put whatever you want there. Eventually, if you leave that unchecked, it's going to kill you. It is going to kill you. Sin is the same way. And the devil is so clever because sin starts very small. Usually it starts up here. It's not even, it's not even tangible yet. It starts in your mind. How does it get to your mind? Well, sometimes it gets there through your ears, through your eyes, through things that are spoken. And these seeds of sin have to be eradicated from our lives. We cannot leave sin unchecked. We cannot leave sin undealt with in our lives because eventually it's going to spread, right? It's like a fire. It's like a cancer. And it leads to death. The Bible tells us this, that sin leads to death. In fact, our sin killed Jesus. Our sin put Jesus on the cross. This is the message of Christianity, that our sin was so severe that the actual Son of God had to die on a cross and pay for our sin. That's the effect that sin has on all life. So, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived that your sin can just go unchecked, okay? God is not deceived. God knows. You can't hide it from God. So don't hide it from yourself. Don't hide it from your family. Don't hide it from, you know, your pastor. If, if there's something that you cannot deal with on your own, bring it to a group of men that you can trust. Bring it to light. 
Don't leave it in the darkness where it can grow and spread. Bring it to the light where it can be eradicated from your life. Amen? Okay. We're going to jump over to verse 7. We're going to come back to it. We're going to go to verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So God's word is very clear. If you say you're a Christian, that doesn't just make you a Christian. I used to work at a company where I had several friends who I would talk to throughout the years being there. I was there about, what was it, five years, seven years, sheesh, seven years. And uh, I was able to share the gospel with with many people there and and had very interesting conversations because you all know when when you work in a secular job, most of the people you talk to, their worldview is couldn't be any farther from your worldview or the worldview of a Christian. And it makes perfect sense, right? The, the, the conclusions they come to, to, to me, seem so off the wall. But it's understandable because they don't have a foundation of God's word. They don't have a revelation of who Jesus was. And so all that to say, there were several when I would share the gospel and get to this very important word, repentance. Uh, it was something that they would try to dodge. It was something that they would try to say, but, but I'm good. You know, I, I, I go to church every now and then. I, I know a couple of verses in the Bible. And so they were trying to say that they were ultimately a good person, right? If you do enough good, some of the bad kind of, it it kind of evens out, right? If I do more good than bad, I'm good, right? If If I do good things that I see other Christians doing, God will be pleased with that. That's enough. I go to church sometimes. I'm I'm kind. I give to to the poor. I I give to the homeless. I, I take care of this widow down the street. There's so many good things that I do. That doesn't mean that you are not a sinner. We are all sinners. In verse 8, it tells us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But it's not just John who says this. Jesus addresses this in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it's it's this whole idea of you can talk the talk, but can you walk the walk? Right? Our walk should back up our talk, bottom line. This is how we know that we are true followers of Jesus. Verse 22 Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Right? You can add add anything good to this question, right? Lord, I I did this. I I gave to this charity. I, I, I helped the homeless. I... I did all this good. I, I donated a kidney. You know, whatever you want to fill that with that you in your, in your flesh think is a good thing. In verse 23, Jesus said, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Unfortunately, that's going to be a reality for a lot of people. When they, when they pass from this life to the next, a lot of people will have a very rude awakening to the reality that sin produced in their life, to the reality that unrepentance produced in their life, which is what? Separation from God. See, that's, what, that's what eternity is. 
Eternity is either in the presence of God, which God is holy, God is righteous, God is everything good, or it's separation from God, which is the opposite of that. Heaven is going to be everything good. No pain, no suffering. What's the opposite of that? Pain and suffering. So for the unbeliever, for those who have not put their faith in Christ, who have not repented of their sin, this is their final destination. This is what Jesus says. You can go to church, right? You can say, Lord, I prophesied in your name. I even cast out demons in your name. But Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me. We have to realize that we are sinners. We have to realize that. That without the blood of Christ, without Jesus coming into our hearts and transforming our lives, we are dead in our sin. We are separated from Christ. We cannot be deceived. We cannot let others be deceived. This is what a follower of Jesus looks like. It's not just talking the talk. It's not just lip service. It's walking the walk. Is my life a reflection of Christ? Is my life reflecting the light? I hope it is. Verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So how do we make Jesus a liar? Well, Romans 3.10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. So we have Paul telling us this. We have John telling us this. We have Jesus telling us this. That we are sinners. There is no one righteous. It's impossible to be righteous apart from Christ. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You see, this is what the gospel message is all about. God is on one side. We are on the other. There's a chasm in the middle. We cannot get to God because we fall short of His glory and holiness. And we needed Jesus to be the propitiation, which is what we read at the end of this passage. He is our advocate, right? He is that bridge that joins us to the Father. He is our Redeemer. Amen. Verse 7. We're going to read verse 7 and 9 together. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we conf Verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, the free gift of salvation is here available to all of us. But we must confess our sins. We must repent of our sins. Say, Lord, I fall short of your glory. I repent of my sin. I turn from unrighteousness. This is, this is necessary in order for the blood of Jesus to wash your sins away. For us today, we must repent of our sin. Now, I had mentioned earlier that there are three things regarding sin. The first one is when, when sin arises in our life, which we are all born into sin, right? We see that from the very beginning. One thing that some of us do that I've been guilty of in the past is covering sin, right? The second thing, and this is a good thing, is we confess our sin. We confess our sin. And when we do that, what we're doing is we're turning our heart to Christ. 
when we confess our sin to one another, but certainly to God, right? When we present our sin before God, what are we doing? We're saying, God, I'm sorry. I've fallen short. And I cannot be in fellowship with you apart from you removing the sin from my life. Help me, Lord. Right? This is what confessing our sin is about. This is what true repentance is about. We first have to realize that we fall short of God's glory. And when we confess our sin, what does it say happens? It says that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is how it happens. This is how we, we overcome sin. We first have to confess it, present it to the Lord. In repentance. The third thing is what we just read in verse 9. We can conquer sin. Right? We confess our sin, and the best part of, about it is that we can conquer and overcome sin. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. If any, and if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He Himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. That word propitiation, in this instance, what it's referring to is satisfying God's holy law. Right? Jesus Himself is what satisfies God's holiness on our behalf. This is what Jesus is for us. That for all who would repent of their sin, their, their, their price, the price of their sin has been redeemed, has been paid for by Jesus Christ. We have the power to overcome sin. And it's not in our own works, right? It's not in our own strength. It's with the power of of Jesus Christ. It's with the power of the Holy Spirit living inside each one of us. You see, when we turn to Christ, when we repent of our sin, when we bring our sin to light, repent of it, and turn to Christ, His Spirit dwells within us. And His Spirit gives us power. Sin is powerful, right? Sin leads to death. We've talked about that a little bit. Death is, is a powerful thing. No one can resist death, right? We are all mortal beings. There's nothing we can do to prevent death because death is powerful. And what is sin? Well, sin is death. Sin leads to death. Sin is powerful. But you know what's stronger? the Holy Spirit, Jesus living inside of us, Jesus equipping us through His Word, through His Spirit. We have the mind of Christ. The Bible says that we are now a new creation in Christ. And being a new creation, we have the power to conquer sin. And that word conquer is not to subdue sin, right? Or to put it at bay, right? Or to chain it back up and put it to the side. Well, that word conquer means defeat. It means it is no more. It is, it is done. It is over. We have won the battle over sin. And this is so important for us to get today because there are some sins that are easy to eradicate. And then there are some that are difficult, right? Maybe they've taken root in our life. And so it's important that we know that we have the power through the Holy Spirit to conquer sin, to break those chains from our life. The enemy wants us to think that we are stuck in our sin, that it's just a crutch that we have, that it's just a problem we have and we just have to deal with it. We don't. We don't have to live in sin. We don't have to live in bondage. Jesus came to save us from that. 
Jesus came to free us from sin. It says that we were a prisoner to our sin, but Jesus came and broke those chains. They've already been broken. We just have to receive it and walk in it. We have to know that that the Holy Spirit living in us gives us that power to overcome sin. But we have to bring it to light. We have to bring our sin to light. This is how we kill sin. This is how we overcome and conquer the sin in our lives. And by doing so, we have right fellowship, right standing with God. Is your desire to conquer sin greater than the temptation that you have to sin? That is a question that we need to ask. When we are tempted, because we're all tempted, Jesus was tempted, right? When he entered humanity, he felt the same things we felt. He hungered, he thirsted, he had a human mind. He was tempted. Certainly we saw the account where he was tempted by the devil. Like many of us are. Like all of us are. What did Jesus do when he was tempted? He went to God's word. It is written, right? He challenged the enemy with the words of God. We need to do the same thing. This is why it's so important for us to be in God's word day in and day out, to be focused on the things of the Lord. God gave us a mind for a reason. But you know, our mind, it's constantly filled with things. We control what we fill our minds with. As a Christian, we need to have a desire to fill our minds with the things of the Lord. Because when we don't, we're opening the the floodgates for the enemy to come in and wreak havoc in our lives. Going back to hidden sin, I just want to touch on this really quickly. Your hidden sin, my hidden sin, our hidden sin, doesn't just affect you. It affects your family, It affects your church. It affects every aspect of your life. And the more you let that fester, the more you let that be, the more pain you're going to eventually cause your family and your church. And so I just want to emphasize that because it is a lie of the enemy that you can just let sin go unchecked. It's a lie of the enemy. It is a flat out lie. Because the enemy knows what sin produces, produces death. So for us, we need to know that God has given us the power to conquer sin. Romans 6, 6 through 7, this is the last verse we're reading today. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, So that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. We have been set free from sin. You have been set free from sin. You're not enslaved to your sin. You have been set free by the blood of Christ. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have given us the power to overcome sin. Lord, your spirit leads us and guides us every day. Help us to be in in tune with your spirit. Help us to be open to receive from you daily. Help us to be in your word, in prayer, thinking on things of righteousness, thinking on things that please you. And Lord, if we have sin in our lives, help us to bring it to the light, bring it to the surface, confess it before you so that it can be eradicated from our our life. 
so that it won't wreak havoc in our life, so that we can walk in light, so that we do not have to walk in darkness, but we can walk in the light and we can be a living testimony of Jesus Christ, a living testimony, a walking testimony of the power of the gospel. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray, amen.